All right, here we go. Today we have D Meeks, the third member of Big Meech and Southwest T's original crew, the 50 Boys, before they formed BMF, who's actually depicted in the BMF TV series as B Mickey, played by actor Miles Truitt. Welcome to Vlad TV. Hey, what's up? What up, though? Well, we recently had your man, Edie Boyd, uh, on the show, who's the original plug for the 50 Boys. So it's only right that we follow it up with D Meeks. All right, thanks for the love. No doubt. No mm -hmm. doubt. Well, let's go ahead and start in the very beginning. So you grew up in Southwest Detroit. Yes, I grew up in Southwest Detroit in a part that is known as the whole. And I grew up down the street from Big Meach in Southwest T. And we lived like across where you had to be from there to come to there. Okay. And why is it called the hole? The hole is like nine streets, basically. It's three communities out there. It's Rouge, Down, Ecorse, and Southwest Detroit. But it's over there, it's like nine streets. So we like a different type of breed over there. And our side is like mostly families in over there. So it's kind of, it's a little different. Okay, and you yourself grew up in a two-family household? Uh, yes. Okay, so were you guys relatively stable or was your parents struggling? Uh, my family... All my family worked, my mother, my father, and I had five uncles and four aunties. So, yeah, my family had a little bit of money. My grandfather, I saved my grandfather, my grandmother, and my grandfather worked at Firestone at the time. So all of them was pretty stable. Okay, so you have the stable family. Yes. But outside your home, what was Detroit like in the 70s and 80s? Uh, Detroit, so it, it depends on what part you went to. You had your good parts of Detroit, you had your bad parts of Detroit. You had some places in Detroit that had like uh, model homes, model um, families, you no know, model citizens. Then you had some parts you go over there and you had your, your street people, your grime, and, and the people who, who meant you no good. Okay. And of course, Detroit is really known for the car industry. Yes. At one point, the car industry started to move out of Detroit, which really caused a massive effect to the economy. Yes. Okay. Did you see Detroit start to go downhill after that happened? Well, Detroit started going downhill yeah, when the car industry started leaving. But it was kind of like going downhill before then because we had started like losing a lot of uh, jobs and stuff out there. Like the, basically the big three, if you got hired as the big three back then, you were stable. Anything else besides construction or anything, you weren't sure. Okay. And, I mean, originally in Detroit, before a crack hit, heroin was the drug of choice. Yes. Okay. And how bad was, you know, the heroin epidemic in Detroit, you know, when you were still a kid? Heroin was a drug of choice, uh, and it's a drug of choice now. But heroin back then was, uh, you had heroin addicts everywhere. And if you sold heroin, and you was a heroin man, or you was the man. You had the big houses, the big cars, everybody knew who you was. But like I said, heroin is a different type of drug. When the heroin addicts need it, they don't care who you are. They will cut your head off for it. Yeah, I mean, I used to hear stories how like, you know, the big drug dealers used to just have like a heroin addict in their crew because yeah. they knew that he would do anything. Like, yes. you know, you would send him to go shoot up the whole house and he, no questions asked because they needed that fix so bad. That, that it just did not matter. Uh, you know, there's movies like, I'm sorry, there was a, a book I read called Dope Fiend by Donald Goins. Mm -hmm. And it started out, it, it, did you read that book, by the way? Yes, I read all Donald Goins, was all on Wonderful. Right. So remember that particular book, it starts out with a heroin house and the guy who's running it is having girls have sex with German shepherds because that's how badly they needed a hit. Well, you know, them stories be true. And like I said, most of the the, uh, the heroin guys were dope fiends. If, if you was a heroin guy and you was a dope fiend, you had the clientele. Because who better is to know the dope is good if you, you own it and you selling it? So a lot of the guys were on heroin that sold it. A lot of them wanting. Okay. And you actually started out selling heroin yourself. Yeah, I started selling heroin uh, when I was about 15. Okay, so here you are in this stable household. Yes. You know, you don't have to sell it. What made you start, you know, getting in the streets and actually doing this illegal activity? From where I'm from, you know, you see a lot of street stuff and all that. And I had uncles 
that were like eight or nine years older than me. So I, you know, trying to emulate my uncles, you know, they'd be in the streets and all that. And I was seeing how they was getting a little bit more money, you know, which I didn't have to do it at all. But, you know, they had like a different type of money. So that's what kind of made me want to try to, you know, sell the heroin. Okay, but that didn't go too well from what I understand. Nah, man, you know, when I first tried it, and I didn't know the game about it, man. You know, I was just really, you know, fresh in the game about the heroin. And I got beat a couple of times about, you know, for some packs and all that. And then it was a different type of atmosphere for the people trying to buy it. Everybody was like, want to do something to you, you know, to the point to where it wasn't even worth it. So I just, you know, left that alone at that, at that time because I was still young and, and naive. Okay. And like you said, you lived across the street from Big Meech in Southwest T. Down the street. Down the street, sorry. And when you started dabbling in the drug dealing, were they doing it as well, or did that come later? Well, at that time, I didn't know what they were doing. You know, we were friends and all that, but they were trying to do a little something, but we hadn't really hooked up like that at, at that time. But we knew, like, they were trying to do something, and I was trying to do something, but... It was separate to where, you know, hey, you, you do you right now and I'll do me and we'll see how it goes. Okay. And then in the mid 80s, crack hit Detroit. Yes. Do you remember what changed when that started happening? Well, crack in our neighborhood came out in 79 because we had some guys that went to the army. And what people don't really know is, like, if you was based in the army in California, California, California already had had uh, crack cocaine, but it was called freebasing back then. So they just brought it back in. So I had seen them. They, they used to sell freebase pipes at our record stores in the 80s. So before crack really hit, hit, it had already hit. Okay. And at one point you went from heroin to crack. Yes. What changed once you started selling crack instead of heroin? Well... The crack cocaine era is different because when the crack came out, people needed that crack real, 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 real bad. But there was a different type of uh, pe people that wanted it because you had people like working at the big three. You had the construction workers. You had teachers. You had doctors, you know, but it, it was a, a good sale without all the risks at the time. Right. I mean, from what I understand, it took a while to really build up a serious crack addiction to the point where you're just living in the street. Like a lot of people were like functional crack addicts, keeping their, yes, you know, keeping their jobs, keeping their family together and then just kind of partying on the weekends, but then going back to work. Yeah. You know, it wasn't until years later that you really started to see the effects of it. Yes. Okay. So with the crack, it was easier and the money started coming faster? Yeah, the money came in uh, much faster. You know, when you when you had a crack cocaine and all that, the crack is a different type of high from heroin from what I have been told. So you really need that, uh, I guess that blast they, they're supposed to be getting. So once they get that blast, and the blast only lasts maybe about 10 minutes. So they be back just like that. Okay. I mean, with that, before you guys became the 50 Boys, were you having any drama with people trying to rob you or kill you or whatever else? No, I didn't really start selling crack cocaine till I got with Demetrius now. Okay, okay, got it. Okay, so then in 1985, one of the big you know, drug dealers in the area, Edie Boyd, was introduced to Big Meech through his nephew, Kilo. Yes. So tell me about how that meeting went from what you were told. Um, from what I was told, Demetrius just had a girlfriend in E-Course and he used to walk past Edric and Kilo's house. And I guess somehow they had got cool. And somehow they was talking. And I guess Kilo put the word in about his uncle. And um, they set up some type of meeting. Okay. Mm. And from what uh, Edie Boy told me, you know, he liked what Meech was talking about. He'd already seen him around the neighborhood. So he said, okay, cool. I'm going to start supplying you. And that's when Meech actually brought you and Southwest T into the fold as well. Yes. Okay. And at that point, that's when you guys became the 50 Boys? Yeah, we came in the 50 Boys then because uh, Edric had a special brand of rocks when he was trying. Edric is good for like 
you know, a promotion gimmicks, you know, if, if somebody's doing this, we're going to go left. So Edric said, well, how could we, you know, because we're a new crew. So we got to have some type of way to make everybody know that we're coming with something special. So everybody was selling like dimes and 20s and all that. He said, let's do 50s. Then we was the 50 boys. Okay. And I guess uh, what one of the terms was uh, boulder on your shoulder? Boulder on the shoulder, always, man, you know. Boulder on the shoulder, you get you paid. Then If you stay boulder on the shoulder, they know you got some good shit. Okay, so by basically branding, you know, yourself as the 50 boys and saying, okay, you got to have, you can only buy $50 worth. You can't come in for 10, 20, five, whatever. I guess it really kind of caused a stir and people started coming from all over to try to cop 50s. Yeah, we had, you know, we lived in like three cities, if you consider down, down river, which is Rouge, Ecos, and Southwest Detroit. But we had people coming from Ipsy. Brownstown, Ohio, Lansing, Flint, because the quality of our dope was so good. We were getting real dope, like Colombian flakes. I don't know if you know what that is. That's the best that you could ever get at that time on the market. And we was the only ones who had it. So to get that real boom, come to the 50 boys, we got you. Okay, so you guys are starting to make money. Yeah. And you guys are starting to expand. Uh, you know, from what I understand, ED really had a very family type structure in terms of the way that he was working with you guys, where you guys would have dinner, I guess, uh, every Sunday and he would take you guys shopping and everything else like that. Right. Yeah. We were like at the end of the week, like maybe Friday that came and it was like a nice concert. We, we would gather all of us up and our women and we would go into like all the concerts in Detroit. Saturday, we would go shopping. That means all of us would go as one, you know. We would go together, shop together, you know, eat together. Then Sunday, we would go have dinner, which we would have, like, meetings at the dinner. But that was our family time to bond, like, to share whatever we had to share with each other that we need to know. That was our time to show that we as one. I remember one of the things that uh, Edie said was, at one point, he took you guys shopping and bought you guys a bunch of furs. Mm -hmm. And then you you guys were on the block basically <laughs> selling crack in the furs with all your jewelry on, attracted all the attention. Yeah. And he just kind of just shook his head and was like, well, what are y'all doing right now? I took them over to the mall, at Northland Mall. Okay, so I, I buy them some meat coats. <laughs> this is a funny story. I buy them some meat coats. So... I'm riding down the street, I don't know, maybe a couple of days later or whatever. And <laughs> Meech ass, me, I see Meech, I see the 50 boys. They out there with their motherfucking chain, they bling on, and they meat coats running up the car selling dope. Mm -hmm. So he see me. <laughs> And he knew when I when I stopped and blew the horn, I, he knew. He said, Edie, I know what you finna say. I said, yeah, man, go take that shit off, man. What the fuck, man? Okay, the, you know, don't, don't act like that shit is something, you know, you ain't used to. Okay, Meech, don't act like, don't make motherfuckers think you ain't used to shit like that, for one. And, and don't get, get, get hot as hell up here, all right? I already got you covered up here, but don't don't take advantage of that shit. Go take that shit off. Man, it, it, you know, it was it, we were making so much money that day. And then it was a holiday. So I guess we were out there just being young and naive, you know, just trying to show off that one day. And he came through. I guess he got the word that somebody said we was out there. And we were making a lot of money, man. We had the whole block. It was like a block party. And he came through and said what he had to say, you know, and put it straight. So we wouldn't have took that shit, you know, took it off and got back right. Okay. And were you flashy back then or were you more low-key? It all depends on what we went to. If we went to a concert, we're going to go dress the best. If we going to a party, we're going to be dressed to impress. If we're on the corners, we're going to be like bombs. Mm. Okay, so here you are, you guys are making money, you guys are getting the girls and the cars and the jewelry and everything else like that, mm -hmm. but in a game like this, 
success always comes with the jealousy. Yeah. And the envy and then the violence. Mm -hmm. And from what Edie said is that basically you guys inherited a beef from him with a guy named Leighton the Beast Simon, who's depicted as Lamar on the BMF TV series. Yeah. The the beef with Leighton. Right. Okay. Now, the 50 boys inherited that beef. That was my beef. Because Leighton is fucking five years plus older than me. So that beef was already, I had that beef before the 50 boys even started. What the fuck is a, a fucking uh, 10, 15 year old dude want to have beef with these young motherfuckers? Were? The beef was with me. They inherited the beef, all right? He, you know, because um, I had beef with Layton when I came out there and I was doing the two for ones and all that. And I just took over that city, okay? I took over that territory. Okay, so that beef with Layton was it. That was my beef. Okay, so tell me about Layton. Well, Layton is uh, Layton was the neighborhood kingpin at, at that time. He was running like E course. He was running an apartment across from the Tour Street Boys, and he was an older cat. And Layton was a different type of guy. You know, he was making money. He had a big rope, it was about this big, and it came all the way down to his waist. He would wear Adidas suits with gaiters, with finger waves. So, and he was getting paid, but he was a beast. He called himself the devil's son-in-law, and that's what he was. The devil's son-in-law. He had it on the back of his Jeep, a picture of a devil, and the devil, uh, they had chrome things you could put on your Jeep back then. He had a devil on it, and he thought he was the devil. Okay, and the way Edie said is that this guy was just sort of crazy, just mentally off. Yeah, you know, his screws ain't right, you know, and he just was like a, 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 a player hater. He was a player hater. Okay, did you have any interactions with him at all? I know him. Okay. I, I, yeah, I know of him, you know. We all know him good. Okay, did you ever get into it with him personally? We all had like, you know, not per this personally, personally. No, I never got into it with him personally like that. But you know, as far as if our crew, if you said personally, I consider if you bother anybody in my crew, which is Edric, E.D., Terry, or Demetrius, then yeah, it's personal. Okay, so you have this beef. Yeah. And it starts to get violent. Uh, Southwest T ends up getting shot in the eye. Yeah. Was that over that latent beef? No. Okay, that was different. Different beef. Nothing to do okay. with that. None at all. Uh, okay, so what happened? What was the beef over when Southwest T got shot? I don't really know. I, I, I We never really, really found out. All I know is he was coming out of the apartment and somebody ran up on him and shot him and shot him in the eye. Shot him in his eye. And, um, that's all I ever heard of. We, we never really found out who or why. Okay. So, and this was really depicted on the TV show as well. He gets shot in the eye and then they take him to the hospital and they do an operation on him, but the operation doesn't quite go right. And he ends up suing the hospital and getting a check. And from what I understand, that check uh, is what, uh, allowed him to start a car service in Detroit? Yes, that, that they started some type of car service in Detroit, but he had got that, uh, some parts of that show are a little, they tell it before it really happened. Like it, it happened before some parts and certain parts happened after certain parts. So they ended up getting the car come, but I think that was a little later. I don't, I couldn't really tell you. Uh, okay, got it. All right, and then Big Meech gets shot in Detroit for the first time. Yeah, that was that was, was down the line. Okay, what was that first shooting about? Layton, uh, I don't. It could have been anything. I'm not really sure. It could have been anything. You, you got to remember, 
Jealousy bring envy. So it, it, it could be it, it could be by the woman. It, it could be by a car. It could be about, you know, anything. When you start making money like that, you know, you can have a friend and your friend could be your friend all your life. But once you start making money like that, he ain't your friend no more. So you never know what what people come up with beef. You see people right now beefing and you don't know why. Well, there is a, a second time that Big Meech got shot. And uh, Edie actually went into this situation a bit. I guess they were at a diner and they just had all their jewelry on and everything else like that. And there was a group of dudes that basically were like, we're going to rob them. Yeah, this was at uh, Stanley Restaurant. It was a group of dudes. And it wasn't, it, it, it wasn't Demetrius that got uh, shot. It was Terry. Terry got oh, shot. Oh, Terry got shot. Terry got shot. He fell in my arms and I caught him. He got shot for... Four times. I thought he was dead, but the situation was we had went down to a restaurant, which at the time was a, uh, it was like a baller restaurant, but it was real. It was like a Benny Hanna's back in the day, but it was called Stanley's. And we were going there, you know, like this was Sunday, and we just happened to go in there, and it was like two guys in there. We weren't really paying attention, and we was on our way, and we all had on like maybe $15,000 worth of jewelry or more. And we had, you know, some dollars with us. And we ended up getting ready to leave out. And the two guys ran out. And I was still in the door. So I had seen it coming. And, we, you know, we had essentially some help in the car, but we could never make it there. So they ran out. I was standing in the door. People was finna call the police. My niece was with us. The guy put a gun to the, my niece's head and said, if you don't give us what you got or give us the money, we're going to blow this little head off right now. That's my niece. We can get some more money. I can't get another niece. What was your niece doing when she had a gun to her head? Panicking. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you, you know, and then she was only like four years old. But then you yeah. know, if a, if you know, if a guy put a gun to your niece head and she's four, he's serious. So yeah, you know, and they, I guess, caught us lacking a little bit. Okay, so he didn't shoot uh, your niece, but he ended up shooting Terry four times? He shot Terry four times. Because when, when, when we was out there, I told you I was still in the door. So he said, if you don't bring your butt back out here, you know, we're going to knock it off. So I came back out there and I was standing. So he was trying to take our jury off. They were trying to, like, you know, snatch our jury off and all that. And they couldn't get the jury off because we had, like, uh, safety locks back then, you know, back then you could pay some extra money and get safety locks. So we always had, you know, we got the best jury, we're going to try to spin it. So he was just trying to snatch stuff off. So they couldn't really get none of that off and they got a couple of dollars, so they start running. But before they start running, he turned around and just shot. I don't know if it was supposed to be like a warning shot, which it couldn't be. A warning shot is one shot. And he ended up hitting Terry. And he shot Terry four times. And Terry fell into my arms. I caught him. And the people called the ambulance, and we took him to the ambulance, and the ambulance took him to the hospital, and they saved his life. Okay. Was that the first time you saw a, sh a shooting in front of you? No. Where I grew up at, I, uh, the first time I ever seen a shooting in Detroit, I was six. And then seven, you know, by the time I was 12, I had seen, I had seen so many people get shot that I was immune to it. Okay. But was it ever one of your people when you're in the situation and so forth before this? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So things are basically heating up with this beef. And in 1988, Edie Boy's mother-in-law's house gets shot up by Layton. My wife called me, and uh, she was driving one of my cars that was was known, and uh, it started like four blocks down. And she said, uh, she said she called me and she said, "Babe, somebody behind me, and they, and they just behind me, and then they just bumped into the car and started pushing the car." I said, "Where the fuck you at?" Okay, so I'm sending people to you know that direction where she at. So. She leaves. I said, leave where you at. Go, go home. Go to, go to your mama's house. So when she got to her mama's house, uh, I guess as soon as she got out the car, my, my wife had to actually run into the fucking house 
because Layton was um was shooting at shooting at the house. My wife got in the house, he shot at the house, bam, and he left. Okay. That's how that, that that's the situation, how that went down. Okay. That was another part of, you know, my wife was like fed up with the, you know, the, the, you know, that type of life. You know, she feared for my daughter's life. You know, everything started coming in, you know, it's just, it started coming in. You have to look at, you know, what your values are in life, okay? Because like I said, I wasn't, I didn't come from a a, a, a poor family. We, you know, I had, I had other options, okay? So that was, you know, to answer your question, that, that was the one fucking beef. Layton, a.k.a. the fucking boogeyman. Get the fuck out of here. You remember when that happened, how serious was that? Was this piece of news? Um, You got to look at it like this. If somebody was to shoot like somebody in your family house up or somebody was to shoot some, my house, somebody in my family house up, you would take that as serious because evidently, they're trying to do some bodily harm to where this person may not never come back. So anytime somebody shoots at you like that, it's a potential danger. So it's, it's always serious. Right, because uh, his sister-in-law was there. I think uh, there was a little kid that was there. Like it was, it was, it could have really just been a, a full-blown slaughter. Yeah, it could have. Now, did you guys ever work things out with Layton, or is it just a beef that just sort of kept kept going on forever in a certain way? We ain't friends. I mean, I just tell you the truth, you know, that Layton beef, you know, I don't know how I haven't seen Layton all that but yeah, but at the time, the beef, you know, is a, if he shot it in your house, the beef would never stop. And that's how we feel, you know what I'm saying? We didn't start nothing with you. You know, we we didn't come, you know, mess with your family. Back then, it was a golden rule. If you in the game, and I'm let this be known, if you in the game and you get into it with like a guy on this crew and all that, okay, you into it with him. You ain't into it with his mama. You ain't into it with his sister. We didn't play that. I could see you with your mama tomorrow and have beef with you. I ain't no run up on you and your mama. She ain't got nothing to do with me. But if I see you tomorrow by yourself, I might run up on you. Yeah. Yeah, it's bad. It was. It sounds like a horrible era to have to go through. Yeah. I mean, at any point, did you say, "Man, this is just too much"? Like, you know, um, you know, m my man's uh, mother-in-law's house got shot up. My partner just got shot four times in front of me. Like, yo, let me just go move somewhere and just get the fuck up out of here. Well, I thought about it like that, you know, but at the time, that money that was coming in, if you know how much money we, we was making at the time, and then, like I said, you always get comfortable with the money because you never think it's going to stop. So I thought about leaving and all that, but I'm a loyal guy. I'm going to try to stick it out with them. If we come into this together, we're going to try to stand this together. So whatever they want to do, if we're going to be together, let's do it. I mean, at its height, how big did the 50 boys get? Like, how many members? It's, it's only three 50 boys. Okay, so you guys never expanded and created a, b a big, huge crew. As you had other crews, like the 12th Street boys, he, he, you know, he was supplying them. He had people out of town he was supplying. He had people on the west side. But as far as just us being a crew, is the 50 boys are Demetrius, Terry, and Derek. Got it. Well, at one point, you guys approach ED and say that you want to part ways. Because um, you guys got your own plug at, at that time? Well, that was Demetrius and Terry, uh, that was on them at the time. You know, they were re really, you know, talking with that. I was just at the time, I'm a silent person. I'm just going to see how I play out. So when they was doing that, I was just, you know, taking our time to see what everybody's going to do. Okay, and I spoke to Edie about this. He said when they showed up and said that they want to go, he said, cool, no problem. You know, because in his eyes, he felt like everyone that he was working with were bosses. 
Yes. You know, the same way that he considered himself a boss. And he was under someone at one point. He went off on his own. So he was like, hey, listen, these guys want to go off on their own. Cool. No problem. There's no static. There's no friction. There's no like y'all owe me. Nothing else like that. It seemed like it was just a amicable situation. Okay, I'm going to tell you something like this. When we came into the game, we had the mindset that if we're going to be as one, we're going to be as one. We, if we have a problem with each other to this day, it's always one phone call away. We're going to be that type of crew that if somebody wants to leave or go and all that, we don't try to do nothing to you and all that. Go on there that, you know, maybe you might even go higher. You might have to come back. We might need you again. But if you want to go off and do this, go ahead. You got our blessing. It ain't no be like, oh, you can't do this. You can't get out the game. You can't leave us. No, we ain't never like that. We're always going to be friends like that, you know. We loyal to each other. So if you want to go, hear my blessing, bro. Do you. And do it well. Well, after they decided to leave Edie Boyd, um, Big Misha decides to move to Atlanta. And this was like 1989? Yes. Okay. Now, you and Meech were, you know, grew up, were, this is one of your best friends. You have a lot of history together. When he told you that I'm leaving to Atlanta, number one, was there a reason? Was it over the beef with Layton or was it, was it just something else? It had a lot to do with, you know, with, with probably some of them might have to do with the beef for Layton, you know. I mean, why would you want to keep, you know, having beef with this guy? And, you know, you can't really do what you want to do. Part of it is expanding. You know, part is, you know, trying to get away from your situation. You don't want to be like, if you in your city and you done made a million dollars illegally, there's no way that you want to go back to the hood and be in the hood you know, stand. So get your money and try to expand and go on. So yeah, when he did come to me, he told me, and it was either I decided to go with him or I decided to stay here and do what I can do on my own. So I decided to stay here. Okay, and Southwest T stayed in, D in uh, Detroit as well. Uh, he went to Atlanta too for a while. Ah, okay. Yes. Okay, so so they both leave and you stay. Yes. And you continue to keep doing the same thing? Yes. I went and got okay. my own. I had a plug. I met a plug. And um, he put me down. And I went and got my own crew. And I sold drugs maybe like for the next eight years. And I became a hood legend. And I made about 1.2 million on a bike. Okay. And while you're going through that, the cops are aware of who you are and so forth. So at what point do, do you start getting investigated and busted and so forth? I got busted. Uh, River Ruiz police ran up on me one time and um, they planted some drugs on me and they took me to jail. And when I went to jail and all that, see, I always kept money for a lawyer. So I had a good lawyer. So I called my lawyer. My lawyer came and got me out which he was a real powerful lawyer. But by then, we was already already on the radar. You know, so by us being in three different cities, you know, selling drugs, Rouge, East Coast, and Southwest Detroit, you had three police units in each one, you know, three different cities of polices that would vibe with each other. So they had put the word about us out. You know, people be talking, you know. Okay, and do you actually start getting arrested and charged? Uh, I got arrested for, I got arrested four times for four cases. Okay. And how did those four cases work out? I beat every case I had. Really? Yeah. I had okay. a bad I'm ass. Sure. I'm going to tell you something like this. This is about me. When I have, when I make, if I make $500, I'm going to put $100 up for a lawyer. Because you never know, you know, when you might need this lawyer. So if I ever... Because you might get busted, you might get killed, you might need some money for a funeral, you never know what you're going to do. So you always have you a bucket for the rainy day. So when they would try to charge me, my lawyer would eat them up. So okay. I beat four cases. Okay, but you did do some prison time at some point, right? Uh, yes, I, I did. I went to prison in 92. Okay, what was that for? 
Shooting an occupied thriller, and it was broke down. Okay, can you talk about what that situation was about? They said that uh, I had maybe try to holler at somebody in, in, in the wrong way to where they, they could charge me. And they ended up charging me, but they had wanted me so bad by me losing the four cases that they just convicted me off. They convicted me off hearsay, but just two witnesses to where they, I got convicted of shooting in the occupied thrilling, which is like shooting in the building or something like that. But it was a different charge. But my lawyer got it broke down. The first charge carried about 25 years. The second charge carried about 4 to 20, which I ended up getting convicted to 4 to 20. I signed an appeal, went back on the appeal. The witnesses never showed up again, and I had to let me go. So how much time did you serve altogether? Two years and nine months. Okay, that was the only prison time you ever served? Only time I've ever been in prison. Okay, so let's rewind for a second. Um, before Meech went to Atlanta, was the BMF name ever mentioned? Yes, before they, before they left, he was kind of plotting the name. You know, they was like uh, trying to see what the name was going to be. But like I said, I, I never knew that they had come up with the name. You know, I would, like I said, I, I wouldn't be in that part of that stuff like that. My job was just to be, you know, like I said, I'm, a, I'm quiet. I go do what I got to do and whatever, you know, all the other problems, you know, once y'all get that settled, hey, we good, you know what I'm saying? But I ain't got to be in that problem if I ain't got to be in that problem. But as long as the decision is good, we'll, we can agree on it, I'm with it. Okay. So in Detroit, there was no BMF. BMF started later on. And, uh, yes. Okay. So Big Meech and then eventually Terry go to Atlanta and they start to form what would eventually become... BMF. Yes. Um, and it really starts to really expand. They end up getting a plug uh, with the Mexican cartel, which basically surprised, uh, supplied them all the cocaine they needed. And they started to become one of the biggest drug dealing crews in America. Yes. Uh, after they went off to, to uh, Atlanta and started to build BMF, were you in contact with them at all or no? No. I hadn't talked to Demetrius, in 31 years. Wow. But I, I, ha, I, I have texted him and all that. But before I, I went to prison, I had like, you know, I was out on bond and Demetrius threw me a party before I went to prison. That was the last time I seen him. I went to a club called UBQs and I didn't even know, excuse me, that he had just started BMF. Because they kept on saying it was this guy upstairs that was just doing it up. And, you know, the people that knew me, so they knew I was dabbling too. So I, they, I want you to come meet him. And I ended up going upstairs and they end up being him, Demetrius. So he said, I heard that you're about to go to prison, which I don't know how he heard. And he threw me a party. And I looked up and I had 13 bottles of Dom Perignon coming in, floating. And I gave, he gave me a hug and he gave me a couple of dollars. And that was the last time I ever seen him. But I just want to say I love him and free my brother, Big Meech. Okay, now what about Terry? Were you in contact with him still or no? Uh, I seen Terry uh, about six months ago. Okay, but no, but during that time when no, they went to Atlanta. I hadn't seen Terry in, in 31 years. Okay, so you never wanted to go relocate to Atlanta and join up to what they were doing. You were just doing your own thing. At that I came home from prison. I, I was straddling with the, you know, the life of, uh, you know, selling the crack and the cocaine and all that. And I had seen what he had did. I went to prison in 92. And three weeks later, three guys that I, well, six guys that I had been dabbling with, you know, hustling with were dead. In three weeks. From people that had killed them. So. My mind was, am I going to come back out and live this life and take a chance now? I done been to jail. The next thing is going to be death. Or do I try to start my life over and be happy and be content? And I chose the latter. 
Well, while you're attempting to, to transition your life to a legitimate, you know, income, Meech and Terry are going the exact opposite direction and they're just getting bigger and bigger. And at one point, Meech and Terry start to really become at odds with each other because Terry felt that Meech was just way too flashy and it was going to attract a lot of attention to what they were doing. And, and I remember BMF had actually flown me out, I think it was about 2000, maybe four or five. You know, I was a mixtape DJ and I, I remember, you know, being flown out to Atlanta and there was the world is BMF, you know, billboards <laughs> yeah, on the side of the freeway. I meet these dudes and they roll up in like $2 million with the cars wearing $5 million of the jewelry and, and, and they're giving crystal bottles to everyone. Like, like it's a flyer. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? And, mm -hmm. and I'm looking around going like, yo, this is crazy right now. Like it, it's, it's clear what's happening. Like me being a complete outsider, you know, they're like, oh, these guys are, you know, have a record label, but it's like, okay, there's no artists that are successful on this label. You know, yeah. Blue, Blue Da Vinci is still a new artist. You know, mm -hmm. He's not selling records. Clearly, this money is coming legally, but they're just so over the top and flashy with it that it's just, it was crazy to me. I mean, were you hearing about this flashiness? Yeah, I heard about it, the flashiness. You know, actually, I had seen a guy that I knew who was down with them and meet him for me a couple of times. You know, he had asked that I want to come down there. And like I said, my life was done with that. But you got to remember, we was flashy before BMF. It's just that we had more money. More money make it flash more. Meech was already flashy. I mean, Meech was shining. We all were shining in. But as he got the more money, I guess he said, well, let me show the world who I am. I'm Big Meech. Right. And, uh, you know, he even said that, I remember there was a phone interview that he said that that's what pissed off the feds, like the the billboards and everything else like that. I was like, oh, okay, y'all y'all want to do all this extra shit. All right, we're going to show you what, what we're going to do. Um, and there's actually an operation um, called Operation Motor City Mafia. Yeah. Uh, that was launched in Detroit. And by uh, 2005, they were starting to indict everybody. Like there was just busts and busts and busts. I mean, did you hear when people started getting arrested? Yes, actually, they, you know, I'm still affiliated with the streets. I mean, you know, my, uh, I do, you know, once you be in the streets in your life and you consider OG, I still have connects that people call me. So that when they got busted, they call me like an hour later and say that they, they, they rounding them up right now. Because you got to remember, they rounded them up from Atlanta, St. Louis. But the main ones was from e course Southwest Detroit, and the west side of Detroit. So that's a big thing in our neighborhood. So everybody, it, it was like the biggest news story out there. Yeah, I mean, 41 people got indicted. Uh, there was 11 counts. Uh, there was 500 kilos of cocaine, 7 million in cash seized. Yeah. Uh, they said the, or the organization was worth $300 million. Yeah, I heard that. Um, and then... One of the underbosses of BMF, a guy named Arnold Boyd, a.k.a. A.R. from Detroit, ends up flipping on everybody. Yeah. Do you know who A.R. is? Rat. You know him personally? Yeah. He lived around the okay. block from me. Really? He, we raised him. When I, when I mean we raised him, it's like, you know how when you're the older guy and you have like like young people that, you know, when you play basketball or something, they want to, you know, look up to you and all that. So he would be around us sometime and all that. But yeah, I know him. I know his whole family personally. His his mama and, and daddy and his sister was like my family's best friends. Okay. When you heard that he flipped and started to actually testify against everybody, what mm -hmm. you think? He wasn't the only one. Him and his brother. Okay. So, I mean, what you asked me, how did I feel about it? Yeah. You're right. Ain't nothing else to be said. I mean, you know, don't do the crime if you can't do the time. Don't sell drugs if you can't go to jail. Don't sell drugs if you think you may not get killed. Don't get in this game and think it's going to be just like this. 
Get in the game and know, know what it's about. If you get caught, do your fucking time. Don't go try to tell nobody else and you just getting just as much money. But then you tell on him, don't you know, wherever you go, jail, back home or whatever, you got that label as a rat. Well, did he end up going to prison at all or did he completely get off by, by testifying? I don't even know. I, okay, you know, so he never he never came back to De to Detroit to the old block or anything. N no, they no, they ain't been back. It, it probably you know, it probably be you know best for them. It, you know, if they never did come back, mm. you know, because like I said, you know, people in certain places in the in the neighborhood take that to the extreme. So you know, if you want to tell, go somewhere else and live. Well. As this case is building up in 2006, uh, the CFO of BMF, the guy who did all the financials, he ends up flipping as well. Yeah. And gives, gives the DEA and IRS all the BMF's books and financial records. Uh, did you know Doc Marshall at all? Doc Marshall. I think I knew him, but I, I can't remember right now. I didn't know him personally. Okay. And then more people start get, getting busted. Uh, J-Bo uh, gets busted. Uh, Wayne Joyner, a.k.a. the Wayneyak, gets busted uh, and so forth. And, you know, essentially it gets down to the point where Big Meech and Southwest T are getting ready to go to trial. They, they put them in the same room together. They start to scream at each other and argue, but eventually they all agree to all plead guilt to, to both of them pleading guilty, which they do. And then on September 12th, 2008, the judge sentenced uh, Big Meech and Southwest T to 30 years in prison. Yeah, I was actually, when they were um, supposed to have been going at it like that, I actually had went down to the courthouse that day because I was going to represent them and all that, but I ended up having to leave before all that happened. But I heard that it happened, and yeah, they got the 30 years, which was going against the RICO law. If you know, it could be, it's a blessing and a curse because the RICO law is life. But then they got 30 years, so you you basically still then lost your life. So it was a sad it was a sad day to me. Yeah, I mean, 30 years. I mean, these guys were I think in their 30s at the time. Yeah. Uh. Yes. Yeah. And I, mean, I guess the reason why Meech took that plea deal was that there was actually a chance of him getting out early if he took that 30 years. If he went to trial and he blew it, then he would get a life sentence with no possibility of ever getting out. Mm hmm Well, I, I don't know nothing about that. All I know is they had got 30 years from my understanding. They had to do 28 of that <clears throat> before they got out. Well, in 2016, uh, there was a guy affiliated with BMF named Ricky McFarlane, a.k.a. Slick. Mm hmm You know who that is? No. When, you oh. know, uh, the, the BMF part, or like Atlanta and all them, I don't know none of them. The, all the Detroit people from BMF, I know yeah. all them. Well, he, this is a Detroit guy. Okay, Ricky McFarlane. Uh, Ricky McFarlane, yeah. He, he was actually convicted in the Motor City Mafia case. Um, and I guess once he gets out, him and an NFL guy named Robert Eddins end up getting killed in a drug deal. Okay, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, uh, that was the drug deal going bad. Right. Yeah, yeah. They was in the basement. The NFL guy, they were trying to do a drug deal. And the guys came from out of town and killed them, left them in the basement. They caught them guys. Okay. So, so you knew these guys. Yeah, I, mean, you knew, I, I, knew, I knew him now. I had to remember, you know, I had to think about when you said that. Not yeah, I remember it now. Okay. I mean, and eventually the Detroit guys, uh, you know, they were indicted and, you know, convicted during that whole BMF uh, era. They started to come out and, and get back into, into Detroit and so forth. I mean, once these guys started getting back in the system, how was it for them? Uh, I... I I, I really couldn't tell you how it was when, you know, most of the guys that came back in BMF or oh, when they got out of like uh, a prison, when they got out of prison. Right. 
most of them, like I said, they were like party promoters and promoting stuff, you know, and they they all came back to society from what I seen. They all were doing pretty good to me. I don't know okay. what they were doing, you know, which is not my business to say. I don't know what they could have been doing, but I know a couple of them have like uh, car washes and all that. So they were doing pretty good. You know, we hustlers. We can make, you know, you go to jail, we ain't no, you know, fall down and can't get back up. We get back up and get back up good. Right. And this whole time, you're basically, you've left the whole street life alone and you just went to work a regular job? I work, I went to work construction <clears throat> when I got out of prison. And when I first got out of prison, it was hard because, you know, they, they didn't want to, you know, hire no felons and all that. But I ended up going to a construction site and... I lied, and I ended up getting a job making $28 an hour. So okay. I figured that, you know, and then I was working all, all over Detroit, and other, so I was making good money. And then I didn't have that worry about if somebody, you know, because at one point in my life, everywhere I had to go, I had to, like, if I went to the bathroom, I'd have a gun. If I went to a restaurant, I'd have a gun. Or you got to have somebody, a bodyguard with you. You know, when I was in that life back then, you know, this was the first time I could walk. I walked down the street one day. And then, you know, nobody never bothered me. I mean, just, it was just like the freshest feeling in the world. No stress. Yeah, I mean, people always like to glorify the drug dealer life when the reality is the, the, the level of stress you have to go through in order to make that money, 99% of the time, is not worth it. I'm going to tell you like this. If you want to be a drug dealer, the drug dealer... It's the worst job in the world. See, what the drug dealers show you right now is, oh, I got all the women, the pretty women. Oh, you get the best women in the world. You get the best cars. You get the flyest suits and all that. But you don't see that guy that's laying in your, your garage, I mean, your garage at night, so, you know, who trying to wait on you. You don't see them trying to kidnap their family. You don't see people shooting at you. You don't see people trying, you know, and they do anything, putting bombs under your car and all types of, you don't see the, the stress and the, you know, the jealousy. The jealousy is what messes up the dope game because you could be right here and selling drugs and have a Benz and you could be the other guy on the other side selling drugs with a Lamborghini and the guy with the Lamborghini hate the guy with the Benz. And y'all making the same money. Why are you hating it? Because this woman like him better than her. The dumbest shit in the world. It's enough money for everybody. It's enough money for everybody. If I can go make $100,000 tonight, you can make it too. But I can lose it too. You know, because most, you ever notice most dope men always, like they so stressed out, they make $100,000. You done made it. Go home. You go to the gambler joint and lose $100,000. Now you got to go back out here and try to make it back. Now nah, this might be the day you die. Well, I think that it's that mentality of, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know if I'm going to go to prison for the rest of my life or I'm going to get killed. So if I have this money right now, there's no long-term planning for it. Let me just have fun as much as possible because my next 20 years might be in a cage. Okay, if your next 20 years in a cage and you got that money and you got somebody that's in your family that you can trust, bump all that, well, I'm going to take it with me. I'm going to go spend it all night by your mama's house. Buy your sister a house, buy some property, buy a car or something, buy some stocks, do something like that. Go start a business. Don't take that money, then go blow $20,000 in the strip club because you're going to jail Monday. I mean, you know, I mean, you might put that money up and your, your, your people might take that money. You get them and put it in some stocks like Walmart or something and you come back and you're a millionaire. But no, you didn't want to spend it on a uh, delicious and all them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not you, <he> bro. <broke. laughs> well, then in 2020, in the middle of the pandemic, uh, Southwest T gets released. Yes. Uh, because of COVID fears and so forth. After he gets out, any contact with you guys? Yes, I seen, I seen Terry about six months ago. What was that like? Me and Terry are always, we family. So it, it was just like, you know, it, it was something about the BMS series, you know, that we, we know we feel something about me, Edric, and um, some people about that because the way they portrayed us and the way they have, you know, 
dipped into our pockets and played us to where we're not really getting compensated like we're supposed to be and we should because this is about our life. So he called me, seen him when he first came home, but it wasn't like it was supposed to be. I gave him a hug and all that, but he ended up calling me. And when he called me, he told, where he told me to meet me at, I knew it was a safe haven. And we went and it was like, I seen him yesterday. Remember, I hadn't seen him in 31 years. So me and my wife went, but you know, me and Terry grew up since we were three. So we ain't got no beef. We all, and we have disagreements and all that, but we always one phone call away from anything. But I got a problem with him. I got his number. But when we did see each other, it was like I had seen my brother. It was like part of the 50 boys was back. Right. You just need a uh, big meat to get out also. That's a money shot. That's how I'm waiting on. <clears throat> if if meat get out right now and me, meet Edric, and Southwest T take a picture right now, that's going to be the money shot. That's what I'm waiting on. That is my goal to have that done, and I'm going to get it done. Well, then in 2021, last year, the BMF TV series comes out. And like I said in the beginning of the interview, your character is called B. Mickey and is played by an actor named Miles Truitt. Yes. Did you know that you were going to be depicted in the show? I didn't know nothing about the show. Really? Yeah. Okay. So when you watched the first episode, you were as surprised as everyone else? No, I I heard they was making a a, 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 a show on us. And I, I figured that, you know, that if, you know, they're going to make a show on us, that we all was about to get paid, you know? Hey, this is my life and all that. And um, 50 Cent came out to my neighborhood. And I hadn't got no calls or none <clears throat> from nobody. And um. He came out to my neighborhood, and like I said, I'm kind of like a little legendary out there, and I got about 25 calls, and they said, well, they out here filming your life story. And I was like, yeah. And I called somebody, and they were like, yeah, y'all got a story that's coming on stars. I didn't know nothing about it. Right, because they changed your name. You know, you're not D. Meeks on the show, you're B. Mickey. Yeah, but that's D. Meeks. He playing yeah. me, it's me. Exactly, exactly. But that's how they get around paying you by just changing the name. Yeah. Okay, I mean, do you feel some type of way about that? Yeah, I feel, yeah, I, I feel a whole type of ways about it, but you know, I'm, I'm trying to wait and see, you know, in case I had to get like some representation on that. You know, this my thing is, it's enough money for everybody. If you're gonna tell the story, and then it's the number one show on stars. Why not just pay me, Edric and, and, and Kato? You're using our image. Everybody, if you go in the neighborhood right now and say, you can walk there right now and go and say, who is the 50 boys? They're going to name them. Go on E-Course, go on Rudge. So I don't care if you say, this B. Mickey is D. Meeks. You know, some of the stuff might be changed a little bit and all that, but you selling the show off my life. I'm selling you. I'm getting you rich. I feel, yeah, I feel a whole... I don't want to say what I want to say there, but it's fucked up. Right, because the Cato character on the show is actually based on someone named Lady? No. Cato uh, or Sabrina. Okay, and Sabrina's who? Sabrina is, uh, she's a 50 girl. She's Cato. Okay, and were you guys in a relationship? No. Okay. And you never killed her, I assume. <laughs> Kato's, Kato's alive and kicking, man. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when you actually got to see the show, you watched the whole first season? Yeah. What did you think? Fifty-five percent accurate, forty-five percent fake. You know, what I mean, a lot of the stuff is real. You know, and a lot of stuff they do. To make it seem like, you know, bam, 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 this is what it is. But, you know, we were in the streets real, real, real deep, but we're not going to tell you everything what we did in the streets. We don't know you. You know, we, you know, you trying to make money. It's stuff that we did. People, we're tasting our grave. You know what I'm saying? You don't just come out and say, well, hey, because somebody want to do a story on my life. Well, let me tell you everything I did in the dope game. You know, I did this. I did this. You know, you got this to where you depicted me as... 
whatever, but then you're not paying me, you know? But I'm selling the show. I'm one of the big topics on there. If, if you ask, most of the time, if you watch the first season, what was your question? What did B. Mickey do this week? Yeah, I mean, he's a great character. Okay, but every week, what did you say? What did B. Mickey do? Is B. Mickey going to do this? Or, you know, is Big Mickey and, 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 and him cool? Did him and Terry get into it? Or, you know, we are all the best of friends. You know, we just ain't no take no shit from y'all. I mean, the the villain of the show, Lamar, uh-huh. uh, who who's based on Leighton the Beast, Simon. Yeah. Do you think that was an accurate description of who he was? It was, it, you know, that one, that's 95%. You know, Leighton, okay. I'm going to tell you a story. Leighton, like I said, we would be on the street called Sally, which is one of our major grounds that we would, uh, you know, do all the hustle at. And he would come through E-Course in his Jeep, him and his boy, and he would have that Adidas suit on. Every other day, he have a different one with the Gators on. And he had a Jeep with some sounds in it. And you could hear him coming down the road playing You Can't Stop the Rain for about nine blocks, right? And he would come up to us and stop right in front of us and just look at us, you know, for about five minutes. And we'd just be sitting there looking at him, you know. And then, you know, he would just sit there for a minute, you know, like he wanted a problem or something and all that, but he didn't want to set it off or nothing like that, you know, because like I said, he, 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 the rain would have never stopped pouring. Yeah, and from what I understand, uh, you know, Leighton the B. Simon is still alive. I guess he did an interview not too long ago. I don't know. I I, I, I don't, like I said, I, I don't know nothing about Leighton. I don't even deal with Leighton, you know. Leighton is, you know, if, if he is alive, God bless him, you know which would be a good thing because, you know, that means you ever notice uh, if you ever uh, interview a drug crew, out of the drug crew, two or three of them dead, you ever notice all of us still living? Mm-hmm. So that's a great thing. So that means yeah. we must have been some type of way smart. We must have been some type of way to keep people off us. And we, we knew what to do to keep you from fucking with us and fooling with us. So, look at that. Somewhere down the line, we must be kind of like slight geniuses. Well, D. Meeks, uh, appreciate you coming in and telling your story. Uh, I mean, the 50 boys, I mean, I was already familiar with them because of what I do and the people I interview. But I think, you know, you guys were put in history because of the TV show. Yes. And I felt that you were an important part of that story. And I think the most important part of this story is that at some point, you were smart enough to realize that you have to pivot out of this life. Yes. And, and leave it all behind because most people I interview who were in this game, you know, the story was, is always the same. You know, I want to do just that one more deal. I had that one deal I wanted to do and afterwards I was going to be out. Yeah. And that last deal is what got him life in prison, like a freeway Ricky Ross or, you know, or a convertible Burt or so forth. It's like, you know, it's very hard to, you know, let go of that easy money and actually go and work a nine to five job and pay taxes and deal with a boss and, you know, go back to being a civilian. But you were smart enough to realize that. And here we are in 2022. You're healthy. You're alive. You know, you're married. I assume you have kids. Yeah. Uh, you, know, you know what I'm saying? You're taking care of your family. And that's a lot better than a lot of the friends that you probably grew up with who are, who are down with you. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you one thing about that before we go. When, when we was the 50 boys, we had a certain time that we would cut off sometime. Like by 9 or 10 o'clock, we'd be hanging with our women. Or Terry would be at home doing the business and all that. It's a thing like if we'd be out there from 8 o'clock in the morning to like 9 o'clock at night, if we ain't made when we'd have made by now, then we don't need to make it. Because like 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, ain't nobody coming out but somebody trying to jack or rob you. And then that's just adding more trouble to where some the, we might have to do something that we didn't want to do or, or, you know, or go to jail or something like that for nothing. So to keep all that out the way, why do it? Nine o'clock come, whatever we made, that's what we're going to make today. And by then, we didn't make plenty of money. But you can't have all the money. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I think the best example of that is, you know, the 350 boys, you know, you, Southwest T, and Big Meech, two of you guys wanted all the money. And one of you said, I've made enough. Yeah. And the, and the two that wanted all the money ended up getting 30 years in prison. Yes. And, you know, granted, Southwest T got out a little bit early. We don't know how long Big Meech is going to last, you know, in, in that cell before he gets out. But- you know, the reality is that they lost a lot of their lives in a cell. Yeah. Whereas you got to actually live your life and yeah. hang out with your kids and, and, you know what I mean? Go eat wherever you want to eat and, you know, have have a level of freedom that they did not experience no matter how much money they had stashed aside. Yeah. I've been out since 95 and I haven't been back since. I, I don't plan to go back. It's, you know, if I, if I hustle, it's going to be a different type of hustle way. It's different type of ways of hustle, but... I'm not finna go back and try to sit up in prison. Prison is hell. I'm a rebel from Iowa, bro. You ain't heard that when public enemy say that shit. Prison mm -hmm. is below hell. And it's just not no place I want to be, and I'm not going to try to be no more where I can be out here enjoying my life and having fun. And, you know, and then sometimes the littlest stuff means so much now to me that I never could see before. So I'm thankful that God has blessed me to see this. That's how we're going to end it. D Meeks, appreciate you sharing your story. Wish Free you all the best. Meech. Free Thanks Big a lot. Meech. Peace. <laughs> all right.